exploring how we can master ourselves by looking at how authors and experts say it is possible. With your host, Shashiti Basu. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 88 of How to Be with me, Shashiti, as your timid presenter, guiding you through life's tricky topics and skills by reading through the best books out there. Being effortlessly confident is a mindset and a skill that can be developed over time apparently. While confidence may come more naturally to some individuals, it is something that anyone can cultivate with practice and self-reflection. Building confidence takes time and effort, which means being patient with yourself and celebrating small victories along the way. Embracing the process of personal growth and development, and with time, you may be able to own the room. So how do we reach this level of confidence? Here is UKCP psychotherapist Mark Varmea from Brighton and Hove Psychotherapy on his thoughts. As a psychotherapist, when I think about the two words confidence and charisma, I think about them in the context of an individual, so how that individual may feel about themselves and how that individual may express themselves in the world. Now, confidence, I think, from a psychological perspective, implies a certain maturity, a sense of knowing one's own mind and one's place in the world, but that doesn't necessarily translate to charisma. Charisma, I think, is ultimately very relational, so it is how we express ourselves in the context of other people. Somebody who is confident may well be charismatic, however, that's not necessarily the case, so... A brief example of this may be somebody who really is quite narcissistic. And one of the attributes of being narcissistic is that there is an expression of grandiosity towards the world, while there is a pervasive sense of lacking in the inner world. So somebody may well learn the skills of being very charismatic. And we can think of a sort of an example in the quite extreme sense of this as a guru, perhaps, or a cult leader who comes across as incredibly charismatic and is able to influence and lead people. But on a fundamental level, they have very little confidence in what they're saying. Our first book is from Viv Grosskop, who is an award-winning writer, stand-up comedian, playwright and TV and radio presenter. She is the host of the podcast How to Own the Room, with over 2 million downloads, and guests including Hillary and Chelsea Clinton, Margaret Atwood, Professor Mary Beard, Nigella Lawson, and very occasionally a man like Brian Cox, a.k.a. Succession's Logan Roy. Her previous books include How to Own the Room, Women and the Art of Brilliant Speaking, and Lift as You Climb, Women, Ambition, and How to Change the Story. As a performance coach, she works with women and senior teams in business and media, helping them to redefine leadership and authority and generally worry less about how they come across so they can actually just do their work. We're talking about her new book, Happy High Status, How to Be Effortlessly Confident. It was a wonderful privilege speaking with her. Hence, here is a snippet of our chat. But find the full interview on www.howtobe247.com or on the YouTube channel. Yeah, the question of confidence when it comes to me personally is a really interesting one. And it's really one of the reasons I've been fascinated by this topic for a long time. It sounds counterintuitive, but I'm not actually someone who's really suffered hugely with their confidence. Um, And it's partly because of that, that I'm able to explore this. And I'm fascinated by other people's different responses. I think if I had, in some ways, I wish I had some kind of amazing redemption story of, you know, I used to be so terrified. I had to hide behind, hide a bush in every opportunity, but I've always been a fairly outgoing person. Um, I was very close with my grandmother, um, child and my grandmother was an incredibly charismatic and extrovert woman. Um, she ran a corner shop. Um, for the best part of 40 years and she was like an expert saleswoman face to face and a very welcoming presence so I grew up watching her and wanting to be like her and was always really influenced by how effortless she was meeting strangers or even you know sometimes in a shop 
uh, you you encounter occasions of hostility. You know, as a child, I watched her challenge shoplifters in the shop. So I grew up watching her being very assertive and confident. And so I always felt very comfortable around that kind of way of being. And it was only really when I started performing stand-up, which was in my mid-30s, when I had three very young children, I started to do that. I moved from being a journalist to being a stand-up comedian, that I really started to find the limits of my confidence. And I really started to identify with what other people would often say in the same way you're describing here of, oh, I don't know if I, I can't do this. This is really difficult. Because that obviously is a very extreme expression of confidence. And it was really from that moment, which is just over 10 years ago now, that I started to become interested in the myths surrounding confidence, the stories that we tell ourselves as a society, um, often a very gendered conversation as well. I think there's also a lot of interesting generational differences about how we relate to confidence and anxiety and all those kind of internal feelings Um, but a lot of the stories that we tell ourselves and that we accept uh, around confidence they're simply not true Uh, and you find this in particular in stand-up you know stand-ups are always amazed uh, when other people think that they're going to be super confident and happy individuals you know often I mean it's a slightly uh, equally cliched thing to say like the tortured sad clown um, but often stand-ups have a very different persona off stage to on stage. They use very, very different kinds of confidence in different situations. And so when you get into that world, you see how flexible confidence can be and that you can dial it up and dial it down uh, and not necessarily in a fake way. You can find lots of different ways um, of displaying confidence. You know, sometimes confidence can be about being a great listener. Sometimes it can be about showing an audience that you that they can trust you and that you're going to be the cheerleader you're going to hold things together other times it can be about being very forceful and powerful so I learned so much at the real sharp end of all of that from when I started doing open mic comedy around 2010 2011 right through to doing my own Edinburgh shows for six seven years like off the back of that from sort of 2014 onwards I was doing Edinburgh shows I really learn on the job, you know, what it is to develop that confidence muscle, to use it in lots of different scenarios. And then in 2018, I launched the podcast, How to Own the Room, and began to really dig deep into other people's journeys. You know, where did your confidence come from? What's the biggest crisis that you faced? What was it like the first time Hillary Clinton ever went on television? You know, how did she become the person that we see now? And I think all of those conversations are so important for people to know about and to understand so that they realize that these things don't come ready formed. You know, most people who come across as confident, they're not necessarily born that way and they don't necessarily behave that way in every situation. They, everybody has a situation that intimidates them. Everybody has things they say no to. I remember early on in doing the podcast, uh, one of the first people I interviewed was Mary Portis, um, the entrepreneur and TV presenter. And I said to her, you know, you're probably the most confident person in the universe. You know, is there anything that you say no to or that you're afraid of? And she said, well, I hate going on television next to, when I have to sit next to a comedian. You know, I hate being on a panel show if I feel a pressure to be funny. So everybody has something that bugs them. And the more we can open up this conversation, the more we can hear from different kinds of people, the more we can accept that confidence isn't just for a certain kind of person. Yeah, so Happy High Status is the name of this new book I'm just about to bring out. And it's a concept I touched on in How to Own the Room when In that book, I was really writing about presentation techniques, how to be comfortable as a speaker, how to find your own version of being like Michelle Obama, if that's somebody that you admire, or how to find a speaker that you admire and figure out how it is they do what they do and translate it to yourself. And one of the aspects of this is this thing called happy high status. Now, this idea is not my idea. It's a very old idea that comes from improv comedy, from theatre, 
I was explored in depth by a theatre practitioner called Keith Johnston, who explored the idea of what is called status play on stage. So this is when you see something in, unfolding in front of you on stage and you can typically see it on loads of examples on screen as well. Everything from Succession would have really great examples of this through to something like House of Cards or any mafia movie. It's where characters are moving up and down in status in relation to each other. So for example, for anyone who watches Succession, it's not about the social status that's a whole other concept, social status and like money and wealth. It's not about social status. It's about your emotional and psychological capital within a group of relationships. So in succession, for example, the status play is between the the siblings, you know, which sibling is up, which is down, who's got the favor of the father, who's in fashion, who's out of fashion, who's going to be in the will, who's going to be out of the will, who's going to lead the company, who's not, all of that. And The point that I'm always making about status is that we are schooled from birth to read this. You know, we do it with our siblings. We do it with our parents. We do it at school. We do it when we watch anything uh, on TV, on a stage. We are always looking for nonverbal cues, uh, for body language, for tone of voice that indicates who has the power in a relationship, who's up and who's down. So at any time when you're doing anything, you have status and you can increase your status or you can lower your status. So the concept of happy high status is about being in a neutral mid zone. It's an idea of magnanimity, generosity of spirit, where you are kind of waiting. So you could be waiting to be called upon to lead where you're thinking, oh, there's an opportunity for me to jump in here and lead. Or you could be thinking, oh, actually, this is going to be a situation where I need to sit back and listen and someone else is going to lead. It's very much a way of moving ego free through life and stepping back a little bit and thinking, what does this situation need? So in the context of stand-up comedy, for example, Happy high status is the energy that an MC or a host might have who's going to come on between the acts. It's the energy of somebody like Graham Norton, you know, who on his show, he's not there to say, hey, everybody listen to me, don't listen to Tom Cruise. Um, He's there to like make everyone feel welcome and smooth all of the interactions to keep the conversation going. He's very happy high status in that regard. You know, he's ready to listen. He's ready to lead. Uh, He can follow, he can also lead. It's a very sort of flexible way of being in the world. And when I first heard about this concept, when I was first um, doing stand-up and starting to do acting and realizing how natural these ideas of status are to performers, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, if everybody was happy high status all of the time (laughs) and we all formed this idea that it's a good idea to just push your ego down a little bit, listen, wait, judge, see what's going on, breathe, (laughs) uh, and not jump in and feel like somebody's attacking you. So you've got to respond or you've got to get in first before someone else can get in first. If we could all just hold back a little bit and be more happy high status, then the world would be a better place. Like nothing, nothing bad would ever happen. So I spent a long time thinking about this and thinking, This concept is quite abstract and it's quite difficult to transfer it from the world of performance into the world of real life. How am I going to do that? And so I dug into it a tiny bit in this book, How to Own the Room. And as soon as that book came out five years ago, so many people would ask me, what is happy high status? You mentioned that in passing. I want to know more about that. And it really gave me the confidence to think, oh, I I think I can explain this to people how important it is and that people are ready to understand that and have this conversation. Happy high status is a term coined by Grosskopf and is a new way of thinking about confidence and how you relate to yourself. It is not about being arrogant or self-aggrandizing, but rather about feeling comfortable in your own skin and projecting a sense of self-assurance. She writes... It's a sort of everyday, ordinary superpower that the greatest performers, speakers and leaders channel effortlessly. 
without even realising it. It's a key quality of leadership and the ultimate life tool. It has something to do with a lack of self-consciousness, because you're thinking more of others than you are of yourself. And it has a lot to do with the quietening of the ego, because it's a reduction in self-importance. This includes the likes of activist Greta Thunberg, who doesn't appear to need to say to herself, I need to look confident. Happy high status is not about perfection, getting it right every time, and never experiencing a low moment. Neither is it about literally being happy all the time. So if this state is so easy to inhibit, then why don't we fall into it naturally and effortlessly? The simple answer is that ego gets in the way, usually in the form of self-protection, risk avoidance, playing it safe, preempting negative judgment from others, or wishing that we were in control when we're not. Judgment is the strongest enemy of happy high status. Happy high status is about attitude and mindset. Confidence is not something learned or acquired from others, but rather something already within oneself that can be consciously summoned. The book encourages readers to grow both sides of confidence simultaneously and offers tips and tricks that can be adapted to each individual's style. It emphasises self-understanding and encourages readers to experiment, make revisions and find what feels right for them. The goal is to challenge conventional notions of confidence and redefine it as happy high status, providing a fresh start and a more neutral perspective. The pandemic has been widely viewed as exacerbating a problem that was already dire. In 2022, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, referenced a global mental health crisis and announced that one billion people around the world now have a mental health issue. That's one in seven of us. These things would sadly not be taken as seriously if they were not accompanied by an estimate of the financial cost. Depression and anxiety alone cost the global economy an estimated 1 trillion US dollars a year, said Guterres. Of course, the human cost matters more than the money. The book is not about the treatment of depression, anxiety or mental illness, because you need to see a qualified doctor for those conditions. But it's written in the context of our growing awareness of the importance of nurturing our self-esteem. Happy High Status aims to help readers develop confidence by embracing their own version of it, adapting it to their personal and professional lives and embracing their flaws as real and imperfect human beings. By harnessing confidence according to their own values and immediate needs, readers can cultivate a more authentic and fulfilling sense of self-assurance. The author says she has become an investigator, and practitioner of flawed confidence, serving as an ambassador for happy high status. They emphasise that no one is always 100% confident, and that genuine confidence involves recognising and accepting moments of insecurity and mistakes. She cautions against tying confidence solely to performance and highlighting the importance of recognising the true evidence of success or failure. A basic illustration of this is a life event that is commonly regarded as one of the biggest knocks we can take to our confidence. Losing a job or being made redundant. But a disastrous loss can turn out to be a blessing in disguise. To succeed in the 21st century, we must rethink the concept of confidence and modernise our understanding of authority and self-assurance. Rather than replicating past models of leadership, we should embrace creativity and openness. Additionally, aspiring for happy high status should not involve imitation, but rather drawing inspiration to tailor it to our unique style. Happy high status is characterised by the following qualities. Authentic. It is not about pretending to be something you're not. It's about being comfortable with who you are and what you have to offer. She starts with saying, be like the 21st century human you already are. This means that no personality transplant is required. Next, she talks about being generous. People with happy high status are not afraid to share the knowledge and skills with others. They're also supportive and encouraging of others' success. The third thing is being kind. 
People with happy high status are kind to themselves and to others. They are not afraid to be vulnerable and to show their emotions. Being resilient is the next one. People with happy high status are able to bounce back from setbacks. They don't let their failures define them. And the next and the final one is being present. People with happy high status are able to be present in the moment and enjoy the experiences that life has to offer. They're not constantly worrying about the past or the future. So if you want to develop happy high status, there are a few things you can do. So one is identify your strengths and weaknesses. What are you good at? What are you not so good at? Once you know your strengths and weaknesses, you can start to build on your strengths and work on improving your weaknesses. Then set some realistic goals. Don't set yourself up for failure by setting unrealistic goals. Start with small achievable goals and gradually work your way up to the bigger ones. Also, take care of yourself. Make sure you are getting enough sleep, eating healthy foods and exercising regularly. Taking care of your physical and mental health will help you feel better about yourself and project a sense of confidence. Be kind to yourself as we mentioned before. Don't be too hard on yourself when you make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Just learn from your own mistakes and move on. And of course, as we mentioned, being present in the moment. Don't dwell on the past or worry about the future. Focus on the present moment and enjoy the experiences that life has to offer. The way to get a piece of happy high status is to reflect on a moment when you felt at your best, recalling the intense joy or pride it brought. Take note of the feelings, physical sensations, facial expressions and surroundings. Try to revisit this memory frequently. Determine why you value confidence and how it aligns with your specific goals and desires. Recognise the costs of insecurity and understand the context of your life. Addressing major crises before focusing on happy high status. Identify your existing strengths and lean on them to bolster your inner calm. Don't make excuses. You already possess abilities that can support you when your confidence wavers. Seek input from trusted friends or colleagues to help uncover your strengths or use online resources like StrengthsFinder 2.0. Vulnerable happy high status is characterised by traits like being softly spoken, supportive and a great listener. This approach emphasises influencing rather than proclaiming and prefers consensus over confrontation. It suits those who might feel uncertain about traditional confidence. Happy high status goes beyond mere stage presence. It encompasses all aspects of life. Realising that status is key to bridging the gap between forced and effortless behaviour is crucial to understand that status influences us constantly, not just during public performances. Entertainer or charismatic happy high status It's about recognising that people are always observing and forming opinions about us. Embracing this quality means learning to control our status effectively. Life is filled with minor humiliations, perceived slights and ego-bruising experiences. But happy high status empowers us to rise above shame, maintain our dignity and pursue our goals regardless. As a comedian herself, Understanding the concept of status in stage and screen performances is crucial, especially in improv comedy which fosters creativity and material generation. It's vital to define your status as a performer in relation to the audience, conveying it at a glance to connect effectively. Mastery of status allows for progress, reduced failure and improved performance in various acting and comedic disciplines. Initially, the understanding of status was limited to social status, driven by material possessions and one-upmanship. However, the theatrical perspective on status, explored in Keith Johnston's book Improvisation and the Theatre, delves deeper into the dynamics between the characters in dramas and comedies. As audience members, we instinctively gauge the hierarchy, hero-villain dynamics, and relationships within storytelling, which profoundly impact our understanding of drama. The changing fortunes of characters 
and their position in the social and emotional hierarchy are as essential to storytelling as the plot itself. We're used to thinking of high status as meaning authority figure or boss, and therefore unlikable. But we believe happy high status when we see it, manifesting as a combination of high status body language, so being still, calm, relaxed, unhurried, as well as and smiling, charming behaviour, and being kind, attentive to others, listening, making people laugh, feel at ease or feel welcome. It's all about your behaviour, your self-perception, and what you choose to display. The crucial part of this is that it's about what we choose. Once we know how status works, we can use it on purpose. The concept of happy high status offers a refreshing and uncomplicated approach to confidence and charisma. It allows us to break free from the heavy connotations associated with those terms. From childhood, we grapple with societal expectations and judgments about confidence, leading to confusion between positive confidence and negative entitlement. High status characters may trigger negative reactions as we resent their authority and fear becoming self-centred. Happy high status offers a more balanced and appealing perspective. To achieve happy high status, reflect on and revisit moments when you felt relaxed and confident. Analyse your feelings, body language and thoughts during those times to consciously replicate that state. Find alternative adjectives like open, warm, articulate or supportive that feel more comfortable than confident. Clarify the specific qualities you need for different situations, like clarity and efficiency, which can be more actionable than a vague goal of becoming more confident. Questioning if confidence is truly necessary for the task at hand, and focus on relevant traits instead. Entertaining happy high status involves playful control and charisma. Those who fit the traditional definition of extroverts and are comfortable in the spotlight succeed in this approach. They lead willingly, listen actively, take risks, and maintain a light-hearted attitude. This style is suitable for individuals who desire attention without dominating the room that have been deemed too much. Struggling to emulate perfect or intimidating characters, we find more value in flawed characters as they offer opportunities for growth. Despite their duplicitous nature, Characters like Henry Hill in Goodfellas demonstrate effective behaviours. While not promoting crime, we can apply such traits to foster goodwill and cooperation in our lives without moral judgement. Leadership and status works best when they are worn lightly. When there is ease, patience and the chill that comes with lowering the stakes, these qualities create space for a surprising discovery, for something that couldn't be planned, for the solution no one else thought of. This is the safe, healthy version of dominant happy high status, having the guts to pave the way for something. Therefore, Grosskopf says we do not need to be held back by our own definitions of who we are. We are able to come across in more ways than we can imagine. The trick for all of us in adulthood is to examine our perceived limitations and to begin to question them. This is what actors do, create a character, Belief in malleable confidence is crucial. Let go of the notion that self-assurance is innate. Anyone can adjust their behaviour with confidence. So become aware of happy high status traits by observing characters on screen. Analyse the behaviour, identifying what impresses or doesn't. Focus on direct and concise communication to exude high status. Allow pauses for understanding and make dialogue a priority. Identify a habit to change that affects your dominance and replace it with a desirable behaviour observed from inspiring characters. Gradual shifts lead to significant improvements. Dominant happy eye status is characterised by charismatic charm and assertiveness. Still, smooth body language, strong eye contact and engaging conversations make others feel special. This approach suits shy individuals seeking to explore assertiveness in a fun and liberating way. 
Our fear of coming across as too dominant can hold us back from our confidence in adulthood, but so can hang-ups and misconceptions from adolescence, the time when most of us form our ideas about identity and self-assurance. In real life, we can become trapped by wanting to be a version of ourselves that will be universally liked, or at least not disliked. The importance of this has been drummed into us by society from a young age. At many stages of life, we've become liked by adjusting our status. Confidence reads differently on everyone, and there is no objective measure of its success. It comes back to the crucial point, really. You are the only person who can truly know if you're confident or not. Achieving true, balanced, happy high status involves self-trust and self-reliance. Being honest and kind to oneself is a process of experimentation without relying on external validation. When you feel comfortable with yourself, charm and benevolence naturally flow, leading to a genuine sense of confidence and charisma. To exude balanced, happy high status, focus on non-verbal communication with relaxed and fluid movements. Avoid nervous fidgeting and unnecessary gestures. Cultivate calmness, openness, and symmetry to enhance confidence. Embrace range and flexibility without faking emotions, allowing emotional bandwidth to expand naturally. Actors exemplify these traits effortlessly due to muscle memory, making stillness a powerful tool for audience concentration. Balanced happy high status combines charm and benevolence, making one likeable, attractive and trustworthy. This model is useful for those struggling with self-consciousness and helps them stand up for themselves. It is also a good way in discussing some of the complications of happy high status as well, as some of the hesitations some of us might have in adopting it as a confidence strategy. Some people are also born into an enviable position effortlessly exuding happy high status. But what about the rest of us who aren't rich and famous, not invited to glamorous parties and work regular jobs? Confidence and status are often projected onto those historically privileged, creating challenges in terms of equality, diversity and social justice. This serious issue should not be overlooked when discussing leadership and opportunities. We should recognise that not everyone is born with the advantages of celebrities like George Clooney and societal prejudices can affect different groups in distinct ways. Confidence takes various forms including generous happy high status which can manifest as confrontation, calm, assertiveness or even walking away. It's important to identify what response feels right for us in each situation without judgement towards others. The key is to act in a way that aligns with our values and makes us feel good about our choices. Remove resentment from your feelings about your own confidence. Choose instead generosity. Choose grounded magnanimity. To embrace generous happy high status, prepare in advance how to respond confidently under pressure. Consider the best outcome for yourself. Buy time in stressful situations and model your version of confidence after positive role models. Look for people who exhibit breezy calm and handle interactions in a way you appreciate. Confidence also comes with doing, with asking, with not assuming, with going before you are ready, not with waiting. The fear of being perceived as a rule breaker can hinder our confidence at work. People often use this fear as an excuse to avoid challenging norms or making requests. The key is to recognise that the fear of how others might react is what holds us back. The hesitation to ask, what if, may stem from being confined within social boundaries. The fear of going against social norms or being perceived negatively can limit confidence. It's essential to examine if your social filter is overly cautious, hindering your ability to express yourself freely. Some individuals need greater self-awareness while others may benefit from being less certain of their confidence. The challenge for those seeking more confidence is fearing being perceived as overconfident. Consequently, they may swing to the opposite extreme and then adopt an underconfident stance. The antidote to this is optimistic creativity. Small, manageable experiments and challenges that push you just out of your comfort zone.
When faced with making a leader happy high status decision, erring on the side of risk and trusting your own judgment is crucial. Sometimes no one can tell you what to do and you must rely on your conscience and intuition. Taking risks fosters change and personal growth. Build confidence for protection and remain calm when facing opposition. Anticipate challenges. Don't link confidence to others' opinions. It's a virtuous cycle. We fear being criticised and showing off. A Norwegian expression, high on pair, represents insufferable arrogance. Expressions like pride comes before a fall imply punishment for arrogance, deterring people from being confident. Two lessons. Too much is subjective. You can't please everyone. And base your confidence on yourself. Socially acceptable confidence always changes over time. The key point about leader happy high status is that it's not static or fixed. Of course, there are always classic lessons in leadership, rhetoric and self-presentation that are going to stand the test of time. Happy high status includes an emotional range, assertive, fierce and gentle, graceful and calm when needed. There are two sides to confidence, internal and external. These two sides of ourselves, the external projection experienced by others and the internal feelings known only to the self are in constant dialogue with each other. Integrating the two parts that make up happy high status is not about winning every time and coming out on top every time. The main internal work is about rewiring your attitude. Real self-belief is evident in stoic defeat or noble failure. It's easy to feel confident when all is well, but true confidence is revealed during adversity. Authenticity and being oneself are subjective concepts, varying from person to person. The perception of real confidence can be challenging, influenced by context and even AI's replication abilities. The ability to judge authentic confidence isn't always accurate, adding complexity to the task of being true to oneself. We stand our best chance of being confident when we feel that we are being authentic and acting with integrity. Confidence is easier for us in situations that we judge as familiar and unthreatening. Beyond that, the individual variations are as many as there are people on the planet. Confidence isn't about conforming to a standard of formalities. Embrace your uniqueness and strengths to create your own happy high status. Developing happy high status takes time and effort, but it's worth it. When you have happy high status, you'll feel more confident and comfortable in your own skin. You'll also be more likely to achieve your goals and live a fulfilling life. Our final book is from Catherine Kay, who is a journalist and anchor for BBC World News, America in Washington, D.C. Claire Shipman is also a journalist and correspondent for ABC News and Good Morning America. In addition to The Confidence Code, together they co-authored Womanomics, The Confidence Code, The Science and Art of Self-Assurance, What Women Should Know, explains how, in comparison with men, women lack confidence. Here is Cathy Kay speaking to Adam Grant for Knowledge at Wharton. So we wrote a book about six years ago on the value of women in the workforce. And for that book, we interviewed a lot of senior women in business, in the military, in politics. And we were struck by phrases that they would use, phrases like, I'm just lucky to have got where I've got to, or I was in the right place at the right time, or, you know, I think I'm not quite ready for that promotion yet. And it occurred to us that we never heard men say things like this. And uh, it just struck us that something was happening with women in the professional space that was not happening in their home lives. When you ask them about their kids or their friends, they think they're great. You know, they're, they're totally confident of their ability to make friendships or be great mothers or supportive wives, but get them into the professional space. And we wondered if it was just anecdotal or if there was actually data behind this. It wasn't just words. They weren't saying one thing and doing another. They genuinely believed they weren't good enough. And when you start looking into all of the data, Wharton's done some of it, 
uh, Columbia Business School has done run numbers on men overestimate their abilities by some 30%. Women routinely underestimate their abilities. You talk to all the psychologists who are working in business schools who will put men and women in front of scientific reasoning quizzes. The women will routinely think they've done less well than they've done. The men will think they've done better than they've done. In reality, they've done about the same. So it's that women's perception of their ability skews below their actual ability. It's not that they're just saying, I'm not very good, but actually thinking they're really good. They don't believe they are as good as they are. And that's why, that's what the confidence gap is. Women don't believe they are as good as they are. How often have you looked back on conversations or opportunities in your life and thought, I wish I'd said or done that? Unfortunately, if we lack confidence, we prefer to stay inactive. And sadly, this seems to be particularly pronounced for women. Confidence means having enough belief in our own abilities that we become active. Lack of confidence, therefore, means being uncertain of whether our efforts will be successful, an uncertainty that makes us scared to even try. A clear example of this can be seen in an experiment by Professor Zach Estes, who had students solve complicated puzzle tests. At first, it appeared to Estes that the male students had performed better than the female students, But on closer inspection, Esther saw that many of the women had left a lot of questions unanswered. So Esther asked the students to retake the test, and this time to make sure they answer every single question. The result? The women performed just as well as men. The central problem was the women's lack of confidence. They preferred to leave a blank space rather than risk giving the wrong answer. But what if optimism played a role rather than confidence? Well, optimism, the attitude that everything is going to be okay, is different to confidence, which refers to taking action. Being optimistic does help, though, as it can lead to action which improves confidence. According to the authors, women's confidence can be different to men's. It is vital to understand, however, that women can act with their softer side and still be confident. For example, as long as you stand behind your opinions and defend your point of view, It doesn't matter if you do it aggressively or not. Active listening and cooperating with other like-minded colleagues, often viewed as more feminine strategies, can also be a demonstration of strength. On the other hand, some women act with fake confidence by acting tough. But there is a downside to this approach. The artificiality of it is easily perceived by others and doesn't benefit us in the way that real confidence does. So women don't have to act exactly like their male colleagues in the workplace. Instead, they can take pride in their own unique approaches. Due to a lack of confidence, women tend to accept worse work conditions than men do. Many women simply don't feel confident enough to put themselves out there. One way we see a difference in how men and women present themselves is in negotiation. An economics professor at Carnegie Mellon University concluded in a series of studies that men negotiate their salaries four times more often than women. And even when women do negotiate, they still expect to get 30% less of a salary bump than men do. A Princeton research team discovered that women speak up to 75% less often than men do when there are more men than women in the room. It is crucial to distinguish between confidence, the belief in our abilities in general, and competence, the knowledge of our qualifications in a field. Confidence isn't always based on competence. Many women feel incompetent and unprepared, even if they're totally competent at their jobs. An interesting example of how self-confidence affects action can be seen in psychologist David Dunning's experiment, which questions students about their confidence. Female students show drastically lower levels of confidence in the rating of their abilities and achievements than male students. Then when Dunning invited the students to participate in a contest, only 49% of the female students signed up, while 71% of the male students did. From this, we see that negative self-perception caused by lack of confidence can cause women to miss opportunities. Like other aspects of our character, Confidence is partially predetermined by our genes. In fact, scientists found that our genetic makeup determines up to 50% of our confidence. 
You've probably heard of the happiness-inducing hormone serotonin. Well, the degree to which serotonin influences your behavior depends on a certain gene. If you're born with a longer version of the gene, you produce more serotonin and be less anxious than if you're born with a short version of the gene. Research with monkeys has shown that those born with the long version of the serotonin regulating gene are more sociable and take more risks, which when translated into human behavior means they're more confident. Babies born with the short version of the serotonin gene and also raised by unsupportive mothers were less confident as they grew up. Yet those born with the long version of the gene who were therefore expected to become confident developed into confident adults even when they were raised by the same unsupportive mothers. So if up to 50% of our confidence comes from our genes, the other 50% must be formed from personal experience. Our environment then determines those other 50% of our confidence. This is partly because our environment actually influences our genes. Indeed, scientists have found that life experiences actually physically alter our genes' shapes and cause them to function differently. Upbringing in particular can be an important factor in our gene development and is therefore crucial in determining what kind of person we become. Regarding human female and male differences, girls are often raised to be more diligent and to follow directions more often than boys, which makes them less confident. Girls are traditionally rewarded for good behaviour, and in wanting to live up to this, they can become perfectionists and less likely to take risks. And in order to be confident, we must be able to take risks. Genetics, upbringing and society's double standards are all factors in influencing our personality and our confidence level. In the end, it's a mixture of both nature and nurture that determines our traits. Even as adults, we can still alter our brains as they possess a wonderful quality called brain plasticity. This means that through certain thought patterns, we can actually cause a physical change in our brains. In one study, for example, people with a fear of spiders received two hours of behavioural therapy for their fear. Directly after the therapy, they were able to touch a live tarantula. Whilst doing so, their brain scans showed no activity in the fear centre of the brain. This result was confirmed even six months later. Instead of accessing the fearful memories, they accessed the calm memories from therapy. Therefore, the fear centre in the brain remained calm, and the centre for thinking rationally was activated. So it's clear that we can learn how to consciously work towards changing our brains and becoming more confident. Specifically, we can create alternative thought patterns to avoid automatic negative thoughts. These are the negative thought patterns that occur, unconsciously, on a daily basis. Changing these into more positive patterns can be a good first step in raising our confidence level. Confidence comes from failing and handling it in a constructive way. By taking more action, you're bound to fail at times. But you'll also learn that failing isn't life-threatening and therefore you won't be as afraid to try next time. The authors say, really, failures should be seen as opportunities to better yourself. Many women are afraid of failure and see it as a lack of natural talent. Instead, it should be seen as an opportunity to improve, because with every failure, we learn when we made a particular mistake and how to avoid making the same mistake in the future. Being confident means not letting fear of failure prevent you from trying to get the things you desire. It can be a hard lesson to learn, but can also change your life for the better. So to sum up, Grosskopf says in Happy High Status that there is a new way to think about confidence and how we relate to ourselves. She calls this Happy High Status, and it's a way of projecting confidence and status without being arrogant or self-aggrandizing. She argues that Happy High Status is not about being the loudest or most assertive person in the room, but about being authentic, present and kind. Kay and Shipman say in The Confidence Code, that confidence is more important than we might think, especially in the workplace. Women are often less confident than men because of their genetic markers, nurturing and society's stereotypes and criticisms of them. However, they can also teach themselves to be more confident if they wish to do so. As most people know, I started this podcast because I lack confidence, so it's still a work in progress and I will continue to keep working on it.
Please join in on the conversation by following at How to Be Twenty Four Seven on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and subscribe on the podcast, which can be found via www.howtobe247.com. Please vote for us at the People's Choice Podcast Awards by July thirty first. The link can be found on the website. Please do leave a review if you found this helpful and you do want to be featured. Remember to check out Patreon for exclusive unseen bonus material from every single interview or for the price of coffee and don't forget to check out the website. Before we go, here's parenting teenagers expert and psychologist Angela Karanja with her thoughts. See you next week. There is a stark difference between confidence and charisma. Now, confidence is your belief an inner belief that you can do that which you put your mind to, that you can figure things out, very comfortable in your ability, inner knowing that you are capable, you are worthy, valuable. And most of the time, it doesn't have to shout. On the other hand, charisma is compelling attractiveness or a charm that inspires devotion in others. Charismatic people are mostly extrovert, very enthusiastic, and speak with a lot of assertiveness. It is possible to be confident and charismatic. Charisma is an externalized expression of self. It does not always come from a place of confidence. Confidence is an inner essence, so compelling, you can feel it. I'll give you an example. A confident person, because they know their worth and their value, most often do not go out to try and convince people of their values and their beliefs. They'll present them, but they influence others by the quality and the essence of their example. Charismatic people, on the other hand, they will assert more often want to convince people to come to their side. And charisma, unlike true confidence, can be a protective mechanism from woundedness and trauma. And that, for me, is the big, big difference.